This tutorial is an introduction to some of the basic features of the language POP11. It's a programming language for artificial intelligence and other applications. It has a core collection of features which are very similar to what you'll find in many other languages and they can be used for general purpose programming but it also has a number of additional features that are specially suited to programming and artificial intelligence, especially strong support for list processing with a pattern matcher. There are also ways of extending the language, which I won't go into in this tutorial, but they make it very powerful for designing special new sub-languages for particular applications and that has been used, for example, in designing an extra language for uh, expressing artificial intelligence control strategies. But for now I'm just going to demonstrate the basics. Here is a set of headings on which I will give some examples. Uh, there will be types of pop eleven entities and I'll show some of them. There are others that I won't have time for. There are types of POP11 control structures, ways of expressing what should happen, when and under what conditions. And uh, the ones I'll demonstrate here are mostly very familiar ones of similar to what you'll get in other languages. Although um, in a different tutorial I have illustrated how POP11 can be used with a rule-based system which has controls, mechanisms that are very different from these. I'll then show how POP11 programs are made up of various sorts of components in addition to the ones that are used for expressing control. For example, there are POP11 expressions that refer to entities, entities that the programs can operate on, different sorts of entities like numbers, words, lists. Then there are POP11 commands which specify actions to be performed. Um, there are POP11 lexical rules which explain how program texts are broken up into words and strings and numbers when the program code is read in by the POP11 compiler. I won't say very much about that but it's worth knowing that POP11 does have such rules and mostly they work as you would expect but occasionally they can be confusing. A very important feature of POP11 which it shares with uh, some other languages of which the most famous is FORTH F-O-R-T-H, is that POP11 makes use of what's called a stack, and I'll show some of the stack operations later. They are crucial to the way procedures work. I'll also show how you can define some procedures in POP11, and um, explain how the inputs and outputs work. Anyhow, let's just start with POP11 entities. So, POP11 entities are illustrated here. Um, POP11 words are created by using the double quote symbol and then some symbols and then another double quote symbol. So CAT forms a word containing three letters. CAT44 forms a word containing three letters and two numbers. You can also use an underscore to join two portions of a word. And one of the important features of POP11 is that some of the words it contains, like define and if, are also words of the programming language. This allows POP11 programs to refer to themselves and POP11 programs to construct POP11 programs, but that will not be demonstrated now. So, to summarize then, words make use of the double quote. Strings are different from words, although superficially they may seem to be the same. Instead of double quotes, use single quote symbols for strings. And there are some important differences in what you can do to construct a string. But the main thing is that each string is an entity of a special type, which is not the same as a word. And if I create the same string twice, uh, for example, I type if and then I type it again with a double equal sign in between and I ask 
are those two things identical and therefore print out the result so I'm saying if I create this string and then I create that string are those two things exactly the same entity that's why I've used a double equals there that asks for very strict tests I'm going to type escape d escape d it's said false in other words these two things are not exactly the same on the other hand if I typed two words so I'll copy that and put a double quote in there double quote in there double quote in there double quote in there and now ask are those two exactly the same thing I'll type escape D it now says true um, why is that important? Well, if I want to use the word if to construct a program, and Pop11 already knows the word if as a programming language word, then every time I construct it, I want it to get exactly the same word. So it maintains a dictionary, which is a sort of table containing the named words. And if you construct a new word using the double quotes, it looks to see if it's already got that word in the dictionary, and if it has, then it doesn't make a new one whereas with strings every time it creates a new entity so I can create a million strings containing just the two letters if and each time they'll use up some more of the pop 11 memory anyway there are other differences between words and strings uh, one of which is shown here I can put spaces in strings so let me just show what happens if I print that out escape D it prints it out with spaces whereas if I try to do that with a word and let me show that it is a string I'm going to make the variable pop per quotes true that will make it in future print out strings with quotes so I'll go back and print this again so now we see he's printed out the string with the single quote at the beginning and the single quote at the end um, if I made it false then it would stop doing that but the main point I want now to make now is that a word cannot include spaces. If I try that and do escape D, I get a mishap. It's a misplaced expression item. It found cat when it was reading to the double quote. In other words, it started with the double quote the and it, after the the it was expecting another double quote and instead it found cat and that's not acceptable in pop 11 whereas if I join them up the, the various parts of that long thing there with underscores they are acceptable so I can just uh, do escape D and that will print out the word the cat sat on the map it could also accept it as a string so if I change the double quote to single quote and then escape D it shows that that's a string that's created okay now um, the differences between words and strings can become quite important in some programs but I'm not going to elaborate on that now the main thing is that both can contain printable items like numbers uh, underscores spaces and so on well a word can't contain spaces now we move to another kind of type, that pop type of entity in POP11. I'm going to clear the output window. And um, so, so POP11 can have integers like 1, 3, 5, minus 77, 3, 6, 4, 5, 9, 9, that's 3, 645,999. And these are positive and negative integers, they're whole numbers. It also has decimal numbers, 0.6 minus 3.5 um, for some decimal numbers it has a shorthand notation for instance if I ask it to print out this thing 5.3 E7 you'll see let me just move that up it prints that out as 53 with 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 zeros or put it another way, it's 5.3 shifted seven times away from the decimal point. 
So um, sometimes that sort of notation is more convenient than this sort of notation, but they are strictly equivalent in POP11. They'll, they'll mean exactly the same thing. Um, now, usually, if you have uh, decimal numbers like these, you, uh, you can add them together and you get another decimal number. So, for instance, I'll put a plus between those two, and I will um, ask to print out the results of adding those together. So it's 0 0.6 minus 3.5, and that gives me minus 2.9, which is another decimal number. But if I start with an integer like 99, I can ask for its square root, and I will not get another integer because 99 is not a perfect square. So if I um, ask for, sorry, the square root of 99, escape D, I'll get 9.94987, that's an approximation. Whereas if I ask for the square root of 100, what will I get? Well, it gives me 10.0. So although 100 does have a perfect square, which is the number, a square perfect square root, which is the integer 10, the POP11 procedure, square root, sometimes called a function because it takes something in and gives something out, will always convert its result to a decimal number. If you give it a minus 99, well, if you allow a system to have only integers, whole numbers, and decimal numbers, then minus 99 cannot have a square root, because um, if you multiply a number by itself, where that number is an ordinary integer or decimal number, you'll always get a positive number by multiplying a number by itself. Even if you multiply two negative numbers, like minus 3 times minus 3, you'll get 9. So you never get a negative number, and therefore the square root of a negative number cannot be an integer or a decimal number. However, if you've ever heard of uh, imaginary numbers, or sometimes called complex numbers, they can be square roots of negative numbers, and POP11 allows that. So if I ask it what the square root of minus 99 is, it prints out this thing, which I'm not going to go into in any detail, but it has two main parts. It says the square root of nine, minus 99 has a real part, which is 0, 0.0, and an imaginary part, which is 9.94987, which you may recognize is similar to that thing there. So, if I asked it for the square root of minus 1, I'm just going to copy that expression and change it to minus 1 instead of minus 99. It says that is an imaginary number or a complex number which has a real part of 0 and an imaginary part of 1, which in um, more common notation might be written as naught plus i, 1.0. But that wouldn't be legal POP11. So POP11 allows you to form this complex expression here to represent what a mathematician might represent as that. So I'll empty this output file, come back here, and press on. So the different sorts of numbers and there are procedures for operating on numbers. There are other things that are called complex data structures because they can contain other data structures. Words, numbers, and strings are can be sort of as complex data structures. You can think of a string as having parts, namely the individual characters. You can think of words as having parts, namely the individual characters. And you can think of a number as having parts, namely the individual digits. But lists and the things that we'll describe below, vectors, are entities that can have parts of any sort. They can contain anything at all, whereas a string can only have characters as its part, and a word can only have characters as its part. So we can put things together into a list, and we do that by using square brackets. So this opening square bracket there starts a list, and then at the end we have a closing square bracket, and all the things in between 
go into the list and I'll explain that in a bit more detail in a minute. So later we will see that we can make things called vectors and the only difference from the point of view of the syntax is that vectors use curly braces. There's a right curly brace and there's a left curly brace whereas lists use square brackets. But the way they're represented in the machine uh, are very different. Lists are made of links that are chained together um, so they're very flexible data structures whereas a vector is a collection of items all strung together in one part of the computer. Um, that difference needs to be explained in more detail than I'm going to have time for now. Um, at some later stage, if you wish, you can look at the teach files that explain these things or look at the Pop 11 primer. So, here we have a variable declaration, vars demo list, and then we're creating a list which starts there and goes to there and that list when it's created will be assigned to this variable demo list so if I do escape D it's created. What's in that list? Well it contains a word if you just write some letters together inside list brackets they are treated as if you had not typed in the word quotes that's a convention uh, in some languages it's the other way around you have to put the word quotes in but in POP11, if you don't put the word quotes in, they're just assumed in a list expression. There are ways in which you can change that by using percent symbols to say stop quoting words and so on. But I won't be showing that here. Anyway, so here we're creating a list that contains the word cat. Then the string cat inside lists, if you want to make a string, then you have to use the string quotes. Then a negative number, minus 66. Then a positive decimal number, 3.54. And now some special syntax, which is this up arrow thing, which says take what's after it, which in this case is a word, which has two letters, HD. And what it's saying is get that word, treat that word as a pop 11 variable that has a value. And don't put the word in the list, put its value in the list. So in fact, head hd is a function or procedure in pop 11 which operates on lists. Just as square root is a procedure or function that operates on numbers, as I demonstrated earlier. So this thing here puts the procedure square root into the list. Here we have the word true which goes into the list. Here we have the string true which goes into the list. And here we have the value of the variable, the global variable. Actually it's a constant but you can think of the variable true. Uh, there are two important words in POP11, true and false, and they have very special values called booleans. And what this says is put the boolean true into this list. So here we see this mixture of items going into the list and that list is created and automatically assigned to this variable demo list. So I'll do escape D and now I can print out what's in that list. So let me just move that up and then print out and we see here in the output file it's got the word, the string, the negative number, the um, uh, positive decimal number and then the procedure head. This is how Pop11 prints out something that's procedure. It puts in angle brackets the word procedure and then the name of the procedure. And then the procedure square root. And here we have the word true. Here we have the string true. And here we have the Boolean special object true, which is represented with these angle brackets to say that's a Pop11 value. So, whereas in many languages you wouldn't be able to mix up items into a list, you can have lists of words, you can have lists of numbers, you can have lists of strings, but you can't have a list containing words, numbers, strings, and other things. In Pop 11, you can. And what that gives you is a lot of flexibility and convenience for certain kinds of programming, but it also means that you can make a mistake and put a string where you intended a word and it might not be obvious until the program runs 
whereas in a more rigid language if you put a string instead of a word in a list that's contained words that string will be detected as, a, as an intruder and you can error message when your program is being compiled so it's swings and roundabouts uh, the stricter programs allow error errors to be caught at an earlier stage the less strict programs allow you to have much greater flexibility for instance you may want to collect some information about a person in a list that information might be various things names numbers and so on so we'll come back to this later patterns I'm not going to talk about in detail now. There is already a tutorial showing what you can do with patterns in lists. Uh, patterns are themselves lists, but they have special items which enable you to s match a list against the pattern in order to extract information from the list. And the teach matches file and the help matches file give more information, as does the video tutorial. Uh, which you can look at on the website. Vectors, as I've explained before, are in part similar to lists, namely you can put anything into a vector expression, but it has different opening and closing brackets, curly brace. So this is a vector with seven items, of which some are words, this is a vector with, are all words, seven is a number, and then this thing is a string. And what you see here is that there is a list sorry this is a list which uh, ends there and starts here and that list contains a vector the vector starts there and ends there and that vector contains words so if I print that out it'll print out a list containing a vector containing words so I should prepare the output file I'll clear it do it again so lists contain vectors as elements and likewise here we have a vector which starts with a curly brace which starts with three words and then there's a list that starts there and that contains some words and then the list ends and then the vector ends so I can print that out and it's perfectly happy to show me there's a vector with some words and then a list. So, um, what I've indicated is that Pop11 has various kinds of items that programs can manipulate, use, refer to, including numbers, words, strings, vectors, lists, and procedures. In many languages you can run procedures but you can't refer to them or you can't have a program create them although they can be created by the programmer uh, when the program is compiled in pop11 procedures or objects just like lists and words and so on and they can be created when a program is running that's sometimes very useful for intelligent programs that learn okay so let's show some procedures at work I'm going to I created a list here just with some words in it, apple, banana, carrot and dumpling and I've assigned it to this variable which is declared by var's demo list I could have done that in two stages I could have written var's demo list semicolon and then that would be a declaration and then I could have created that list and assigned it using the arrow which goes from left to right to demo list but as you can see in this case I've had to retype demo list so sometimes when you declare a variable if you know exactly what its initial value is going to be it's simpler just to use the equal sign although it's not an equality sign in that context to do the immediate uh, assignment and then you don't have these two separate expressions anyhow we have this list demo list and we can print it out escape D and it prints out as usual with the two asterisks which are produced by that print arrow symbol there and then the list bracket showing it's a list and the words in the list now uh, I can also print out 
the procedure head and that just tells me that it's a procedure called head but instead of printing out procedure I can run the procedure I can give it something to operate on I do that by putting its input or the argument as it's sometimes called the argument of the procedure inside round brackets and then writing the name of the procedure in front of that so head takes one object and when I run the procedure I can get the result of running it in the output file and it's the word apple so that's because head takes the first item of a list and returns that as its result as we shall see it puts it on the stack all inputs and outputs for procedures go via a public stack which I've been using without talking about tail is another procedure I can print that out and it says that's a procedure called tail and I can apply that procedure to this list demo list remember the list demo list has apple banana carrot dumpling it hasn't changed since I created it even though uh, the procedure head has been applied to it it's got the first element printed out but it hasn't changed the procedure it hasn't changed the list so if I ask for the tail that will give me a new list which is everything except the first item of the list so the tail of the list is uh, a list containing the three words banana carrot dumpling and without apple and of course if I apply the tail function the tail procedure to the tail of the list I get the tail of the tail of the list and that will be just carrot dumpling if I take another tail tail of the tail of the, tail of the list I get just a, a list with one word, dumpling. And if I do another tail, so we're looking at the tail of the tail of the tail, tail of the tail of the tail of the tail of the list. So we need four closing brackets there. And we get the empty list because there's nothing else after the last word dumpling so what happens if I ask for the tail of that does it have a tail now in some languages it will say that the tail of a list is itself the empty list but pop 11 says no the empty list doesn't have a tail it's got nothing more in it that you can't ask for its tail it also doesn't have a head so if I ask for the head of the empty list I'll get a similar error mishap message a non-empty list is needed here it's looking f for the head there it was looking for the tail right I'm going to quit this output file now and um, we can use another procedure which operates on lists and other things called rev uh, remember that demo list had these words in alphabetical order apple, banana, carrot, dumpling and rev is a procedure I'll just print it out it's a procedure called rev if I apply it to that list it produces a new list but it produces a new list with the items in the reverse order so now it's dumpling, carrot, banana, apple and that list will also have a head and a tail so I can ask for the head of it and you can see what the head's going to be the head of the reverse of demo list is going to be dumpling and if I ask for the tail of the reverse of demo list it'll be a list that includes everything except dumpling so it'll have carrot, banana, apple so let's reverse that uh, get the tail of the reverse and we get carrot, banana, apple as I just said square root as we saw before is a function or procedure you can give it something a number and it'll produce another number if we apply it to demo list however it says mishap number needed so you can't apply square root to a list 
we can apply it to number. Max is another procedure, we can apply it to two numbers like 66 and 77 and it will return as its result the larger number. That's why it's called max. There's another one called min. If I ask for min of 66 and 77, it gives me the smaller number, which is 66. There are other kinds of procedures which are recognizer procedures, or sometimes called predicates. They tell you whether something is true of something. And in this case, it's looking to see whether the word cat occurs as part of, sorry, not the word cat, the string cat, occurs as part of another string, which was rat catcher. So it can only return, uh, it will return false if it's not part, but if it finds it, it counts how far along the, the string you have to go in order to get the thing. So if I ask it, is cat a substring of that? It says four. So it's the f start of the fourth character of the string. R A T C is the fourth character. If I ask whether rat is a substring of rat catcher, it will say it starts in the first character. Some languages start counting everything from zero. Pop 11 is more intuitive for most people, although it may be annoying for computer scientists, but Pop 11 starts counting from one when it's counting the contents of structures. If I ask it if hat is a substring of rat catcher, I then get the answer false. So this thing can sometimes return a boolean false, the other boolean is true, and sometimes a number. And in some languages that would not be allowed. No procedure can sometimes return a number and sometimes return something else. But it turns out often quite useful if something says, no you can't do this in some circumstances, and in other cases does it and gives you the answer. So that's why it's useful to have some procedures that return false in some cases, otherwise they give you a useful result. And is Trump string is one of many in Pop11. Okay, I'm still talking about entities in Pop11 and I have already given examples of variables. So far all the examples have been global variables declared using the word vars. Later, if you encounter a procedure definition you'll see that inside the procedure you can have a variable and that will be called a local variable and that's usually declared using LVARS. I say usually because occasionally there are times when you want to do something different but I'm not going to go into that. Properties are another kind of entity in Pop11. Let's clear the output file. So sometimes you want to associate a lot of information with some entity. For example, a company may have uh, information about its employees and it may want to have a property for each employee. So in this case, we create a new property and in here we have a list of things, list of two element lists. And it says that f we're going to have a a kind of value which is called name and the actual value will be Fred. And we'll have another kind of value which is age and the actual value is 62. Another kind of value which is nationality and the actual value is UK. Another kind of value which is married and then the actual value could be the boolean true. So I put the up arrow there saying I don't want the word true, I want the value true. Um, this number says how big the property should be, so although we only have a few items in here, we allow it to grow bigger. And in fact, if you get more than 20 items, it will just be a bit less efficient. Um, if we ask for what, what a value is and the property doesn't know about it, it should just return false. And this thing here says that if some things are no longer needed, they can be removed from memory, but I'm not going to explain that. So if I mark this, starting with the 
variable declaration, personal one, and then I say we're creating a new property which will have these entities and we assign that property to person one. If I ask you to print out person one, it just says it's a property. Now I'm going to copy this and have person two. So we can have a name Mary age 65 say nationality UK married to and we leave the rest the same and assign all of that to person 2. Notice that pop 11 allows a procedure call to go over several lines although we need these commas in there to separate the items it could all have been written in one line, it would make no difference. So I'm going to use Control D to compile everything from there down to there. And once again, I can print out person 2, and that will just be a property. But I can ask for the name of person 1. How do I do that? I write person 1, and then I put the word name in there in double quotes and escape D to print that out and th the name of person 1 is Fred so what will happen if I ask for the name of person 2 the name of person 2 is Mary suppose we want to say that Mary and Fred are married to each other I can then say Person 2 goes to person 1 spouse. So now if I ask who's the sp spouse of person 1, print that out. It tells me that that's a property, um, but if I want to know who it is, I can ask what's the name of the spouse of person one. So what that means, I, I, I can do this more clearly perhaps by putting brackets around this, saying get me person one's spouse and that will be a uh, it'll be it will get me person two because and person two is a property so because that's a property I can apply it to name to find out what the name of the spouse of person one is and that gives me Mary what happens if I ask about the spouse of person two Does Mary have a spouse? False. We've only done a marriage one way. But we can set it up in both directions by taking this thing and saying person 1 is going to be the spouse of person 2. Okay, now I've done that. I've typed escape D to compile that. So now I can ask who is the spouse of person 2. Previously I had false. Now it says it's a, it's a property. And if I ask what's the name in that property, it gives me Fred. So inside these properties, we have two of them, we have different kinds of information about person 1 and person 2 and we can get the names of their spouses by using first of all find out who the spouse is and then secondly find out who the name of that individual is well 
what this shows is that you can start off with a property that has some components, then you can add more components. I added spouse. We could start adding the children, we could add their jobs, we could add all sorts of other things, their hobbies. And this makes a property a very flexible kind of data structure. Uh, as you acquire more knowledge about something, you can extend the property that has the information about that. Sometimes we do that using just lists, and sometimes uh, that will suffice for simple programs. But when you're writing quite a big program, uh, lists can be clumsy, and properties are more useful. Well. I'm just trying to indicate some of the very various kinds of structures you can create in Pop11 and how you can refer to them. There are many more that I haven't referred to, and also you can define new types. For instance, if you're creating a um, program to do things on geometric objects, you might want to have points with two dimensions, you might want to have some points with three dimensions. Well, you can create two dimensional points and three dimensional points by specifying that these are record classes and um, you'll automatically get procedures available for accessing and changing the contents of those entities but I'm not going to show that today right now we've seen that you can create entities of various sorts and I've also illustrated that there are procedures which can do things like changing the contents of something or finding the contents of something and in the case of numbers you can add them and do other things um, sometimes you want to do a complex sequence of operations and in POP11 as in all other languages you can just write a collection of sequences in fact that's what we did here I I uh, had an operation here to create person 1 and then to print out some information about it then another operation to create person 2 and then I printed out something about that then I printed out this name of person 1 and name of person 2 then I changed some of the contents of person 1 by saying it's got a spouse and person 2 will be the spouse and so on so these are sequences of operations and in between I printed things out um, sometimes you want to um, perform a collection of actions um, which is not fixed and what you do should depend on what you get when you perform various tests so for instance you might want to say if someone doesn't have a spouse then you should treat them in one way and if they do have a spouse you should treat them in another way and that will make use of a conditional instruction and in other tutorial files uh, conditional instructions are shown I want to now go on and show something about loops uh, in POP11 as in many other languages you can have a loop which specifies something so for example you can have numeric loops for instance if I want to print out the square roots of the numbers from 1 to 10 I can say bars number and then say for number from 1 to 10 do and then compute the square root of the number and then print it out and then end for so this construct is one of many that starts with 4 in POP11 and in this case it's doing a numerical loop namely it's taking a number and then keeps changing its value until it's got to some target value and then it stops so declare that variable escape d to make this run and it prints out all these square roots 1, 1 1.414, 1 1.732 and so on all the way up to 3.16228 which is an approximation to the square root of 10 but you can also have loops that operate on lists so for example I could create a list um, containing cat, mouse, dog, elephant and assign that to list 
get D, so now that list is there. And then I can have another variable which is item. And then have a loop which says for item in list do print out the length of the item. And for so notice that over there we had for number from 1 to 10. Now we have for item in the list do something with the item. So that'll mean, it'll tell me that the first item has three letters, the second item has five, and then three, and then elephant has about eight. So let's just do that. I'll mark from item to the end of this type control. Now I'm going to first clear the output file. Okay, it's, I'll do escape D, uh, control D. So it says the links are three, five, three, and eight. So it went through the elements of this list, and if there had been 65 items in the list, it would have done this instruction length of item 65 times, and then I would have had 65 numbers printed out over here. Here's something a bit different. I'm going to take two lists. One list is A, B, C, D, E, and I'm going to do something for each element. So I'll um, let the item 1 become A, then B, then C, then D. And whichever it is, if it starts with A, then I'm going to take item 2 and let it, in turn, take one of these elements. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And then I'm going to create a list which contains item 1 and item 2. So initially I'll have A, and then I'll have A1, A2, A3, A4, A5. And then I'll have B from that list, and then I'll have B2, B1, B2, B3, B4, B5, and so on. So that will produce quite a lot of items. And um, uh, because I'm not doing anything with this list of two items, but just putting it on the pop 11 stack, it just sits there, then when this loop, nested loop with another loop inside it, is finished, it'll just print out all those things. So, let's just clear the output file and run that program. So, look at what it did. It printed A1, A2, A3, A4, A5, then B1, B2, B3, B4, B5, then C1, C2, C3, C4, and then C5, and it got to the end of the line, so it wrapped around in D1, D2, D3, etc., then E1, E3, up to E5. So, because there were five items in there and five items in there it produced a total of 25 items you can check that yourself if you want to so that's a nested loop I'm going to contrast that with a parallel loop so here we're taking these two loops sorry these two lists A, B, C, D, E is one list 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 is another list I'm going to take these two variables, item 1 and item 2, and we'll have item 1 running down the first list, and item 2 running down the second list, as we did before, except they're going to run in parallel. So we'll take item 1 to be A, and item 2 to be 1, then item 1 to be B, and item 2 to be 2, and so on. And then, as before, we construct a new two-element list with item 1 and item 2. So whereas over here we had all the combinations and there were 25 of them, here we just get five lists with one item from that and one item from, from that. Then another item from this, another item from that, and so on. So let's just see what that looks like. So I'll just come and make a clear space over here. So I've marked the range from there, declaring those two variables. And then the loop starts with four and then to then 4 and then I print out what or everything has been left on the stack and I get A1, B2, C3, D4, E5 so that's a different way of producing a loop by essentially running two processes in parallel as opposed to running one process inside another 
as we did over there. There are other things we can do in POP11 to make things happen uh, in parallel, but I'm not going to go into that now. I just want to mention that POP11 allows you to create things called processes, and then you can run a bit of one process and a bit of another, and then continue the first and continue the other. And that's a bit like what an um, operating system does. So POP11 can be used to write a simple operating system if you wanted to. And in fact, there's a teach file showing how to do that. So, I have so far been constructing quite a lot of objects, namely numbers, strings, words, um, lists of words, and so on. And for each entity, I've used an expression. And some expressions are relatively simple, like the expression 1 or the expression 10. Other expressions are quite complex because they contain sub-expressions. The simple expressions just refer by naming what they refer to. So you can think of as the number 3 as being a sort of name for the number 3, the n or rather the numeral 3. 3 is just a name for a number 3, and the numeral 33 is just a complex name for the number 33. Um, on the other hand, when we make a list, uh, or a property, as we had in the previous example, it refers to something, but what is referred to may be a result of a construction process. So we can think of the numbers as sort of pre-existing in the language. and. Um, this expression 33 just refers to that number 33 that already exists. Whereas in the other cases where we used things like the uh, list brackets, we were constructing something. How we constructed a two element list made of the value of item 1, the variable item 1, and the value of the variable item 2. So some expressions refer by naming, other expressions refer by constructing what they refer to. And others refer in an indirect way, for example, when we w used an expression to refer to the name of the spouse of someone. So um, here we got the spouse of person 1, and then we wanted to get at the name of that person. We applied this expression to that one, and we didn't actually construct the name, the name was there all before, but this thing uh, was a way of accessing what that name was. So there are different ways in which expressions in POP11 can refer to things, and um, all of these different ways have to be learned, and they're used at different stages in constructing a program. The last point I want to make for now is that when you write a sequence of characters, it may or may not be legal POP11. So, for example, if I want to write uh, 33 plus 5, that's le or 333 plus 5, that's legal POP11, and it'll actually break it up into three items, a number, the plus sign, and the number. But if I write 333 um, word quote 5, that won't be legal POP11. And in fact, uh, if I try to print out the first one, Escape, escape D, I get 338. If I try to do that one, I get a syntactic error. There's a missing separator. You can't just have 333 followed by the opening word quote. So what that shows you is that although this got broken up, it got broken up into three items, 333 plus and 5, and that's because the POP11 lexical rules say that if you've got numbers and then you get a plus sign, then that means you have to break it. Here it broke it as well, but it didn't accept the result. You, that was an illegal kind of thing to have. Um, the POP11 lexical rules mostly do what you expect, but sometimes they can be a little confusing, and um, uh, they you just have to learn them, and there are um, tutorial files, and the POP11 primer tells you a lot more about them. Stack operations I've illustrated by just putting things on a stack when programs run and when loops run, and then later they can be printed out using the, um, the this print arrow, which just prints out everything that was on a stack. 
um, unless it's invoked inside a loop or inside a procedure, in which case it only prints out one thing. I've also shown you how you can give inputs to a procedure and it can produce outputs which are then put on the stack and then can be printed out with that print error. And um, over here, define a little procedure called add pair, which will take a list of two numbers, list, and then it'll add them and produce the sum. So if you give it a list, it takes the head, which should be a number, and the head of the tail, which should be the second number, and we can just see how that works. Uh, escape C will compile that thing. I can give it the list 3, 4, and it gives me 7. I give it the list 5, 6, gives me 11. I can here give it a whole lot of pairs, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and so on, inside a list. So there's a list that starts there, and goes to there, and it contains all these pairs. I can give that to the pop 11 procedure one of. What does one of do? Well, if you give it a list, it'll randomly choose an element of the list. So each time this thing runs, it'll choose one of these. And then I can give that to add pair. So if I run this, escape D, I get 7. It must have chosen 3, 4 to add up to 7. If I do it again, I get 27. It must have chosen 13 and 14. If I do it again, I get 11. It must have chosen 5 and 6. So I can do that several times, and it's chosen randomly. And sometimes you get the same thing twice, sometimes not. So you can write programs in POP11 that do different things uh, when they're run, even though the code is the same, because POP11 contains some of these random randomizing procedures, of which one of is an example. There are other randomizing things. And I'll end with a tiny bit of graphics. Let me get rid of the output file. If I do users of Clib, that loads a graphical library. If I use RC start, that creates a graphical window which came outside of the viewing area of this demonstration. So I'll move that in, and I'll now have to move the code down a bit so you can see what I'm going to do. And I have a little program which, sorry, before I do that, I'm going to just show you what RC draw line does. It takes four numbers. A st two numbers for a starting point, and the graphical display has a coordinate system with the origin at the center. So minus 100 will be back there somewhere, and minus 100 plus 100 will be a point up there. And 50 minus 50 will be a point along and down. So that can draw a point, draw a line rather, from the point minus 100, 100 to the point 50 minus 50. And we can see what that looks like. If I change the minus 50 to 50, then it'll start from the same position over there, up there, but it won't draw it to down here, it'll draw it to up there, so up there somewhere. So it's drawn there. If I do RC start, it'll just clear everything there. So what I'm going to do now is draw some lines at random. We'll have two points. I've got two local variables, point 0.1 and point 0.2. And for point 0.1, I choose one of these things at random. Then for point 0.2, I choose one of these things at random. And then I use RC draw line with a procedure called explode, which takes a list of two things and then separates them out. Because RC draw line doesn't take a list, it takes four numbers, as you can see here. So explode point one gets two numbers and explode point two gets another two numbers. These numbers over here have um, a first value, an x value that goes through 10, 30, 50, 70, 90. So the points on this thing will go from left to right. But they can be negative val y values, positive, so the first one will be low above the m middle line, the next one will be above and then below and then above and so on. So these represent points scattered around the line here above and below. 
And the same is true here, except it starts with a negative number and gets more and more negative for the first value, so minus 10, minus 30, minus 50, instead of getting 10, 30, 50. And then instead of starting negative and positive, this starts positive and negative and so on. So let's see what happens. If I, I'll first do it once. So I've marked from there to here using the function keys f1, f2, and I'll have control D to do that. And it chose one of these, it chose one of these, and drew a line between them. I can do the same thing again, and it chose another pair of lines. So what I'm now going to do is run all of this with a loop. It's going to clear the picture, and then six times it'll choose a start point, an end point, a draw line, and then it'll sleep for five hundredths of a second. So, it drew some random lines. Maybe I'll make it sleep a little bit longer, maybe for um, 20 hundredths of a second. And as before, sorry, I've now gone and um, got the wrong window up. So I'll do it again. RC start will clear the picture, repeat six times, clear the variables, get point one, get point two, and then RC draw line, exploit point one, exploit point two, sleep for 20 hundredths of a second, and it'll repeat that, all that six times. Okay, do it again. So you can make a collection of slightly different patterns. And if you were clever, you might be able to find a way of making a program draw some more interesting patterns. But that's the end of this demonstration of some of the functionality of POP11. And there's a lot more, and other teach files, other tutorials will demonstrate some of the other features.